President Jin, uh, very, uh, thank you very much for all your explanations. There has been some question raised on how the bank will do the voting for decision making and a possible, possible veto uh, right from the Chinese side. Could you please comment on this? Thank you. I would like to very much thank you for this question <laughs> because there's been lots of confusion and lots of you know, um, problems with this, the so-called veto power of China. We have the voting power structure or share allocation structure between regional members and non-regional members. Asian countries, including Australia and New Zealand, Korea, and Singapore, relatively developed countries, developed economies, account for 75% of the shares of this institution, and 25% uh, of the shares are claimed by the non-Asians. So it's very important for us to make sure that non-Asian countries, particularly European countries, would feel comfortable sitting on the board of this bank, claiming only 25% of the shares and voting power. If they are worried whether they can truly have a role to play, and if they're worried about their voices, if they're worried whether they will be ignored, I don't think this bank could be a success. So it's very much important for us to heed the opinions, concerns, voices of each and every member. But when it comes to the share allocation, it was truly a very difficult issue. You cannot do this arbitrarily. You must have a kind of formula. So the Asian countries agreed on the formula of GDP. For Asian countries, as for the non-Asian countries, 25%, we leave it to them to work out by themselves. They do not have to follow the GDP model. At the end of the day, they end up having also the share allocation based on GDP because this seems to be the only possible option. You know, So among the Asian countries, China's economy, because the size of China's economy, we, at this moment, have 30% of the shares. And our voting power is 20.606. Why this decrepancy? Because we make a rule that all of the countries would have the basic votes, free votes, plus founding member votes. Basic votes and founding member votes would account for 15% of all the voting power. This is designed to give smaller economies higher voting power than their shares, and the bigger countries with lower voting power than shares for the purpose of giving voice to each and every member country to the extent possible. So at this moment, the Chinese voting power, 20 points 26.06% is the de facto veto power because supermajority is based on two thirds of the number of members and three quarters of the voting power, which means 75% of the voting power. Now we have 26.06%. We do have the de facto veto power. You may remember when Chinese ID was initiated two years ago, we said at the very beginning, in order to provide sufficient capital to this institution, China was willing to provide up to 50% of the capital of this institution. And when new members came in, the Chinese shareholding would be going down. But that comment was unfortunately quoted out of context. People just forget about what we said, the eventual dilution of the Chinese shares. They only say, oh, we want to have 50% of the shares. But by the time we, we negotiate on the articles agreement, Chinese voting power is already 30%. Okay, now with 30, about 30 countries waiting to join this bank, our voting power would go down, probably approaching 20%, even lower. 
What is most important is we are not going to change the supermajority, which means two thirds of the number of countries, three fourths of voting power remain the same. If you look at the Bretton Woods institutions, each time new members join, the big shareholder will not agree until you raise the supermajority. When I was in the World Bank 35 years ago, the biggest shareholders' voting power was 21%. Special majority, 80. So one vote is veto power. Later on, when the biggest shareholders' voting power continued to go down, prior to that, the supermajority would go up. So even now, with 16.6% .6 of the voting power, the big shareholder still clings to the veto power. Please, we do not do that. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more before the coffee break. A very quick one. Uh, anybody have a question? Thanks. Um, you've spoken very eloquently, Mr. Jin, about some of the, many of the concerns that people have and, and talked about them. But there's one other aspect that I wanted to raise with you, which some people in other Asian countries have mentioned to me. Um, and that's that this bank is really designed uh, to increase China's standing and power in Asia, uh, increase other countries' dependence on China, and also as a vehicle to support Chinese state-owned enterprises. So I want to ask you, you know, China's putting up a lot of the capital. China has a lot of influence. I mean, you've talked about the veto power. But what does China want from this bank? And what does China want in return for the money that it's putting out? Thank you very much. Uh, the bank is owned at this moment by 57 member countries. And it will be owned by probably close to 100 member countries. If this bank would be a bank manipulated by China, I would like to ask you a question. Why do this country become so crazy to join this bank? <laughs> no, they won't join this bank if they are convinced that this is going to be the instrument of the Chinese government. And we, all of this country, work out the governance structure and uh, policy papers. If you put these policy papers and articles of agreement alongside those of other MDBs, if you are fair, if you are unbiased, you would have to acknowledge these policy papers are better. That is why people are willing to join. But having said that, I do not rule out the possibility some of these member countries still have these concerns. Chinese power, rising power in economics, in politics, cannot be stopped. And it's a good thing for China to be a contributing member in the international community. Now, ironically, when something happened, some people say, hey, China, you should do something. Why don't you do it? You want our power? So people are ambivalent about any major economy with their political and economic power. They like it when they think it works in their interest. They don't like it if it does not work in their interest. I think what is crucial is to, for China to work in the broad interest of all the members of the international community, which may not be good for any specific country. But as long as we do something which would be good for the broad-based economy and members, it should be something good. And uh, with regard to dependence, I would say to a certain extent, we need dependence. We need interdependence, all right? I would say China depended, has depended on the multilateral development institutions and the bilateral support from all of the countries over the last three decades. We open up looking forward to support from the international community, and we have benefited from that. But you should not allow this dependence to be excessively dependent kind of thing. So when we say interdependence, we help each other. And helping each other is important. And uh, relying on the support 
from your neighbors, from other countries, no sin. So if they believe that they can depend on China for their sustainable economic development, this is something very good. Now, if they're worried about dependence, why are some of these countries so worried when Chinese economy slows down? Right? So please look at all these issues in an unbiased manner. I want to say if China can offer support to other Asian countries, to other, to some of these European countries, I think it's something very good. Now, one of the European countries told us, we have budget problems. We are faced with debt problems. We still want to join this bank. Why? Because when we are in difficulty, China is generous. China helped us. This is very touching. So please do not reject dependence. We need to depend on each other. So for each and every country, excessive dependence on others is always a problem. Don't be allergic to this kind of cooperation. And you can say this is cooperation, this coordination, if you are positive about this. And if you're negative about this, it says, oh, this is dangerous because you depend on China. With regard to SOE, uh, you may see that Chinese SOE are undertaking reforms. And uh, there are some other countries, in, even in Europe, uh, who has very good SOEs. I think SOE uh, in China should uh, continue to reform to improve their performance and uh, they should do better. Um, as I said, as we go forward, more and more country would be convinced that what we propose to do is good for all of us. And throughout this whole process, we will never forget this is not a credit to China. It's a credit to all of the member countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.